it's time for me to get my little espresso cup, have some coffee, the coffee's ready, and it's time for another episode of The Octopus Wars. So sit back, relax, have a cup of espresso or a glass of Malbec, and enjoy another tale from the world of the Octopus Wars. Another tale from the world of the Octopus Wars. We are in for a treat with this one today. It was buried deep in the archives, was never released. I had to dust off some notebooks and dig deep to find this one, and it's a pleasure to share it with all of you today. Hi, this is Andrew from Luxor. I love the podcast. When I was a kid, we used to hear about the Mandaruktu, the white cheetahs in the Andes. We'd love to hear more about them. Thank you. The Night of the Manduruk II. Catface Laguna told the young Bohemians that, after speaking to Sister Paranax, he felt so guilty about fooling them so many times that now he wanted to set things right by telling them not one, but two valuable secrets. The young Bohemians met the waiter at the back of El Pinguino. After a long day at work, Catface Laguna was having his moment of rest or Reposo, which he called reflection, sitting on a crate of onions and sipping his favorite drink, Averna. You know, I come to work every day regardless, because I am a professional. I come in if I'm tired, if I am happy, if I am sad. It is like this. If I am sad, I come to work. If someone upsets me, I come to work. If I stub my big toe, I come to work and smile at the portenios. Here, have another empanada, I say with a smile. A true professional I am. He nodded and gulped down some of the dark beverage, content with himself. But you know what, he said to the young bohemians. If I had ever come across a little fortune then maybe I would work a little less, maybe just enough to come here, touch an octopus, and remember my beloved Venice. Catface recrossed himself. But it is too late for me now, but not for you, young punks. What I will tell you is a real treasure. It is that Whenever you make up a lie or excuse, say something that no one would ever want to admit to. Then everyone will think that what you're saying must be true. We already knew all that, said Pachito. Crazy Cole and Fat Grano nodded. But I never provided you with the examples, said Catface Laguna, putting the bottle down for a second. Here's an example. You say... I didn't come to work because I ate some bad fish last night and was sitting on the toilet all night long, sweating so much that now I have a bad rash on my back. Do you want to see it? What man would say that to a stranger, especially in the presence of a lady, unless it were true? And when you tell people this about your stomach ache and sitting on the toilet all night and about the rash, they'll say, sure, of course, thank you. No need to show me the rash, and don't worry about missing work. Please go home. Or you say something else no one would admit to, like, I didn't do the work because I tripped, flipped over, and landed on my butt, hurting my tailbone so bad that now I can eat only standing up. No man would admit to something so foolish, you see. We heard all this Zanata before, vivo, said Aledro. In fact, Grano tried the bad fish excuse and no one bought it. They thought his stomach could handle it. We want a real secret. A real secret you want, hey? Catface looked at Fat Grano and shook his head. 
So they didn't bite the hook, he whispered, thinking about why the lie had failed. Okay, fine, fine, fine. I will tell you my most valuable secret, only because I am too old to take advantage of it myself. In the pre-Cordillera, at the Andes, but before, there is a nice little vineyard owned by a nice old lady. She is of Swiss descent. It is a beautiful little house in the foothills. Her name is Doña Fina. The vineyard is small, but it produces here and there some rare golden grapes. Golden grapes? asked Cole. Yes, these grapes are not golden brown, but golden in color. They look just like a gold nugget. Anyway, I know a Frenchman who visits Mendoza every month and would pay quite a bit of money for those grapes, but they are hard to find. You can find them only on a night like tonight, on a night on which there is no moon and it is very dark. Otherwise, in the moonlight, all the grapes look golden, and the golden ones won't stand out. But that is stealing, said Cole. Catfish Laguna looked at Cole and said, Not really, because the old lady doesn't want the golden grapes. She thinks they are, um, how do you say, abnormal, said Cole. Yes, abnormal, Mr. Brains, thank you very much. You would be doing her a favor. Nobody wants those golden grapes except for this French connoisseur. If you go find those grapes tonight and bring them to me tomorrow afternoon, I plan on sleeping in tomorrow morning, he said, looking at the Averna. Then I will pay you, and later I will sell those golden grapes to the Frenchmen. The Bohemians knew right away that Catfish Laguna was not telling the truth, because he kept smiling after telling the story, liking how it was all coming together, and he was enjoying his Averna a little too much. But they decided to go along with the story to finally outsmart him. Hours later, late into the night, the Bohemians observed from afar how Catface Laguna left El Pinguino and was walking toward the Precordigera and carrying a can of golden shoe polish in one hand and a bottle of Malbec in the other. The Bohemian stayed a block behind him but could hear him whistling and chuckling to himself. The Frenchmen will buy the golden grapes. Young Bohemians, here are your grapes. A Frenchman will spend money on them. <laughs> the Bohemians observed how Catface Laguna arrived at a nice little cottage with a small vineyard in the backyard. It looked just like the farm he described to them. He went straight to the grapes and, laughing aloud, started painting them one by one with the gold shoe polish. A golden grape here, a golden grape there. He kept saying, he was sweaty, breathing hard, and working hard, but giggling to himself. These grapes are so hard to find, he said aloud. We caught you, Sanatero, said Aledro. Nice try, said Cole. What? said Cafis Laguna. What do you mean you caught me? You should be thanking me. I came to get some of the grapes for you. He dropped the can of shoe polish behind his body, but his hands were covered in gold. Hey, maybe these grapes are abnormal, he said, looking at his hands. They are staining my pretty hands. How am I going to serve food tomorrow? The things I do for you young punks. Sanatero, said Puchito. Suddenly, Doña Fina stepped outside and said, Chicos, chicos, which means children. Chicos, come inside. Come into the cottage. Doña Fina was famous for having many rabbits in her backyard. It is getting late and the winds are coming. The Manduruk too are sure to come out tonight. You all must go inside. The Manduruk too are coming out tonight. What a pleasure to see you, said Cafes Laguna. We will hurry home. Sorry to disturb you. I am sure that we will be out of here before any uh, Manduruk twos come out. No disturbance at all, said Doña Fina. But you really must come in now. It is dark with no moonlight, so surely the Manduruk too will be coming down from the Andes. You won't have time to travel back to town. And I have enough puchero for everyone. 
My sons are today in Salta, so you can use their beds and stay here the night. Doña Fina was also known for her delicious puchero. Grona made a big smile. Thank you very much, Doña Fina. We will have some puchero and then maybe head back home if the winds die down, said Cafe's Laguna. The young bohemians in Cafe's Laguna entered the cozy cottage. A few rabbits ran out of the cottage when the door opened. Doña Fina immediately set the table near the fireplace and served everyone hot food, as was customary in the provinces. The cottage looked like one from Switzerland. The large fireplace emitted a golden glow that covered everyone and everything. This puchero is much more delicious than the one we serve at El Pinguino, said Cafes Laguna. The young bohemians nodded. Cafes Laguna gave them a look, as if saying, don't push it. Whenever Doña Fina spoke about the Manduruktu, Catface Laguna kindly nodded in agreement, but looked at the young bohemians with a smile in his eyes, communicating to them that there is no such thing as the Manduruktu. Doña Fina said, They look like giant white cheetahs, but with blue eyes and giant thick white whiskers that look like bucatini. They live in the cold and always seek cozy things. Cozy things? Interesting, said Catface Laguna, chewing some of the beef from the puchero. Makes sense that a creature in the cold would seek out cozy places, observed Cole, who had a scientific mindset. Catface Laguna's wine was running out, and so he started to get a little bit fidgety and started to look at his watch, which was always covered in sweat and kitchen steam. Maybe we should all start heading back. I think the wind's have died down. It sounds a bit calmer out there, he said. A loud sound from outside, probably buckets being blown by the wind, did not corroborate Catface Laguna's wishful thinking. My dear Catface, I hear you like Averna, said Doña Fina. Well, it so happens that one of my sons left a crate of liquor that... Two is made from fennel. It is right over there, taking up room and collecting dust. As I do not like spirits, you are welcome to take as much as you like. I would love to get rid of that crate, which I can't even move in my old age. On second thought, said Cafis Luguna, rubbing his hands together, we could stay the night and avoid the storm and the Manduruk twos. After all, it would be irresponsible of me to have these young men travel in the cold where there might be those giant uh, lions with the big fan. They are not lions, Doña Fina gently corrected the waiter. They look like cheetahs, but with blue eyes and giant whiskers. That are as thick as Bucatini, added Aledro. The Bohemians we're not surprised that old Catface had a change of heart about staying, now that the crate of liquor would be by his side. Doña Fina brought up how, in their search for coziness, the Manduruk II took one of the most beloved and cherished citizens of Mendoza, Miguelito. He was too cozy, perhaps the coziest. They took him with them up into the mountains, said Doña Fina. I knew Miguelito, said Catface Laguna, shaking his head. In sadness, I never saw a more charming person. Everyone loved him and wanted to be with him, to touch him. When he would come to El Pinguino, it was as if the Pope had arrived. Everyone wanted to be near him, to touch him, to hug him. He would hug people with his eyes. Everyone would shout, Hey, Miguelito, come here, come join us. Not the kind of treatment most people get. But Chito gave Catface Laguna a look, conveying, You certainly don't get that treatment. At this, Catface Laguna squinted his eyes at Pachito, before kindly smiling at Doña Fina. Catface continued speaking about Miguelito. To tell the truth, and this reflects more about me than Miguelito, I must confess. I thought he must be a fake because no one could be that nice all of the time to all of the people. But then Miguelito proved me wrong. He certainly did. He came to me when I was working, busy setting tables, and he said, Catface, why don't you come over tomorrow night to the house 
and take a break from all this work. We can have dinner together and you could tell me your stories. Me? I said, a humble waiter? To be invited to your home on a Saturday night? I thought he was joking, but the next day I show up to his house and there he is waiting for me with his whole family. His family prepared a whole table for me and treated me like the guest of honor. They even bought a bottle of Averna just for me. We don't believe it, said Puchito. A person like that, he would have too many commitments on a Saturday night. You would be invited maybe on a Monday night or Tuesday morning, added Allegro. Hey, young punks, this is true. And he laughed at all my stories and hugged me. I thought, this person can't be real, but he was. And then he actually walked me back to work. But that was not the end of the story. When we got to work, one of the waiters was trying to unclog a stubborn toilet. Sorry to bring this up during dinner, Doña Fina. Doña Fina urged him to continue the story, as any memory of Miguelito was cherished by everyone. She was enthralled by the tale. So Catface continued. Miguelito, though dressed in a suit, said, Let me show you gentlemen a trick I learned in the Navy. He did not think he was above us or above the task. Cafes Laguna got up from the table to demonstrate what Miguelito did. So Miguelito went over to the toilet. He puts the plunger on it, but doesn't push hard on it as we all do. He lets the plunger sit there gently and make a seal with the toilet, you see? And then he simply pulled the plunger up. And with one pull, I could not believe it, he removed the clog. He did all this because he wanted to help. That is the kind of person he was. And that is why the Manduruk too took him up to the mountains and are keeping him up there indefinitely. He will make their lives cozier, but we sure do miss him. Catfish Laguna whispered to the young Bohemians, He probably ran off with some girl. There's no such thing as the Manduruk too. This is an old Chutzma tale. Don't be scared, my boys. The wind started picking up. Doña Fina closed all the shutters and doors, preparing for the arrival of the Manduruk too. I will sleep upstairs, and you men can sleep down here. I will bring some blankets, pillows, and cushions. May we leave the fireplace burning, please? asked Grono, who was frightened by all the noises outside. Of course, my dear, said Doña Fina. I wouldn't have it any other way. The young bohemians got under their blankets, but Cafes Laguna said he wanted to stay and sleep in the rocking chair and enjoy a little bit of the licorice liquor. He dragged the dusty crate of them right next to the rocking chair. For about one hour, the wind could be heard whistling through the house. Catface Laguna, too, started whistling a tarantella, acting as if no one should be scared by these sounds. Everyone fell asleep around midnight, but a loud scratching sound on the door awoke everyone except Doña Fina, who was sound asleep upstairs. What is that? asked Grano. Catface said, It is probably a Viscacha. Don't worry about it, young men. Viscacha? Sounds too powerful to be a Viscacha, noted Crazy Cole. And I hear five of them, I think, said Aledro. The sounds are coming from... Different directions. Cafe started looking from side to side. His forehead became sweatier. It is the worst sound I ever heard, said Aledro, covering his ears. Just sit tight, young man. It's just the wind and some hungry viscachas. It is not at all the worst sound I ever heard. Now the door started shaking as if something were kicking it repeatedly. Catface Laguna wiped some sweat off his forehead. Let me take a look through this little crack in the door. He got down on one knee to look through a crack toward the bottom of the door. The bohemians huddled around him. What do you see? asked Aledro. Um, they look like... Yes, asked Cole. They look like giant cheetahs. And? But, but they're white added Catfish Laguna. What else? asked Aledro. 
and they have big blue eyes and thick whiskers that look like that noodle. Bucatini, said Puchito. Catface Laguna gently dropped his bottle on the ground. Bucatini with anchovy sauce, he said. I can smell them. It is the Manduruk too, shouted Aledro. Grano ran and hid under his blanket. Catface Laguna covered the crack with both of his hands. I am not cozy, you creatures, he shouted at them. I am not cozy at all. I am cold and from the lagoons of Venice. Save us, Sister Paranax. The hinges on the door started to loosen. I have a plan, said Cole. He grabbed a hose and squeezed it through the small crack through which they were peering. On the other side of the door, on the outside, the hose landed in an upright bucket that had been blown there by the wind. Perfect, whispered Cole. Bring me the crate of the liquor, said Cole to Aledro. What? said Catface Laguna. My liquor? Yes, it is our only option, said Cole. Pachito poured a bottle of the liquor into the hose. Catface Laguna looked at the hose as the liquor traveled from inside the house to the bucket outside. He was very sad about this. The Manduruk too started lapping up the liquor. Just one bottle for them, said Catface Laguna. No more, just one bottle. Bring me another one, said Cole. The Bohemians were working together like disciplined soldiers. Catface Laguna was not happy about this arrangement. This is working, said Cole. The creatures seemed to love the licorice liquor. The sound of them drinking it filled the room. All five creatures were drinking from one bucket. Hey, slow down, you felines, shouted Catfish Laguna. Now that is the worst sound I ever heard. These creatures have no manners or courtesy. They have to learn to share, said Catfish Laguna. As Cole emptied the last bottle, the drinking sound became slower and slower. Hmm, said Catfish Laguna. That is what happens when you overdrink, my friends. Soon it was quiet. The creatures under the pitch black sky crawled back to the Andes, zigzagging up to the foothills. Cole slowly opened the door. Did they leave anything in the bucket? Maybe a nice quarter of a bottle or maybe just a glass? Asked Catface. Not a drop, said Pachito, showing Catface Laguna the bottom of the empty bucket. Cole's plan worked. Thank you, Mr. Brains, for giving those creatures all of my liquor. There was no choice, said Cole. Maybe there was. You could have given them some of the the puchero. Push it through the hose like you did with the liquor. Maybe that, too, would have knocked them out. Who knows? Puchero can be very heavy. The next morning... As Doña Fina was making breakfast for everyone, and the breakfast included patay and tocino, the young bohemians told her what had happened in the middle of the night. Thank you so much, Catfish Laguna, for giving up your liquor to save us. They probably wanted to come in more than ever because it must have been very cozy in here with the fireplace and so many people in here snuggling and snoring, said Doña Fina. Senora... I always do what is best for the group, not for me, but for the group, said Catfish Laguna, bowing down, but knowing that this was far from the truth. By chance, said Catfish Laguna, did your sons happen to leave anything else for you that might be in the way that I could get rid of for you? Oh, yes, said Doña Fina, there are some horseshoes outside. Catfish Laguna forced a smile. Not what you wanted, huh? said Puchito. You know, you should sometimes do things for something other than your own big belly. Catfish Laguna considered this while picking up the empty bucket that was outside, which smelled like a mixture of cheetah, anchovies, and licorice. As the men left the house and said goodbye to Doña Fina in the manner that was customary in the provinces, they noticed the zigzagging footprints of the Manduruk too. The footprints led to the mountains. The Bohemians and Cafes Laguna started walking back to town.
wait, said Cafis Laguna. The Bohemians turned to him. Miguelito, he said. He turned back and looked at the mountains. He slowly started following the footprints of the Manduruk too. The Manduruk too are probably still hungover, said Cafis Laguna. If I know anything about drinking, they are hungover right about now. He is right, said Cole. This could be the one chance to go over there, go to their den, and see if Miguelito is there. The Manduruk too are probably exhausted because they are nocturnal. And hungover, added Cafis Laguna. They walked up the Precordillera. It was hard to follow the footprints because they were not in a straight line, but they did tend to go in a certain direction. Cole said, Follow the general direction of all the meandering paths. That is where they are headed. After hiking up into the woods for about an hour, they arrived at a large enclosed area, fully enclosed by trees. In that area, they found the Manduruk too, all lying on the ground, snoring, and with their limbs sprawled out in different directions, they were breathing very hard. Catface Laguna walked up to one of the sleeping creatures. Have you no self-control, he said. May this be a lesson to you all. And this was supposed to be my hangover, not yours. Catface Laguna? Catface? Catface Laguna? Is that you? A voice could be heard coming from a cave nearby. It's me, Miguelito. I am trapped in here. Catface Laguna and the young Bohemians rushed to the cave, which was covered by a heavy stone. It took all of them and a weakened Miguelito to move the stone just one foot, which was, fortunately, enough of a gap for Miguelito to exit. You came to rescue me, said Miguelito, who now had a beard and smelled like sardines which was what the Manduruk too would feed him. Megalita hugged Catface Laguna. You rescued me. You rescued me, he said. You must get him to Doña Fina's house and call Dr. De Vartolo, said Cole. This man will need medical attention. And so it happened. For two days, Megalita rested and was treated by Dr. De Vartolo at Doña Fina's cottage. Afterward, Miguelito was escorted to town by the Bohemians and Catface Laguna, and a giant crowd was there to greet them. Catface Laguna and Miguelito, walking side by side, waved to the crowd. Everyone in Mendoza was there, with a banner stating something to the effect of, Welcome back, Miguelito, or We love you, Miguelito. The young Bohemians, of course, did not enjoy such fanfare. Catface Laguna expected all this. But what he didn't expect, and what brought a tear to his eye, was that, though half of the banners read, Welcome back, Miguelito, the other half of the banners read, Thank you, Catfish Laguna, you are our hero. (laughs) 